Welcome to Firearms Friday from the Wyoming State Museum here in Cheyenne. I'm Evan Green. I'm the firearms historian here at the museum. And since about 2018, I've been going through the firearms in the museum's permanent collection and doing some research on those, recataloging, making some videos, and uh, doing some research and trying to connect the firearms to stories, incidents, or people in Wyoming history. And this one has a pretty good story with it. What do we have here? This is a Sharps bore chart patent from about 1889. You're familiar with the Sharps rifle and history, maybe. They were used in the Civil War. They were then a breech loading firearm that used a paper cartridge. By 1864, they were making cartridge rifles, the famous 1874 sporting rifle. And this bore chart came about again in the late 1880s. And it was perhaps the first rifle that was attempted to be sold that was hammerless. It has an internal hammer and it operates similarly to the uh, traditional sharps in that you lower this lever that opens the breech and you can insert a cartridge into the chamber. Then you close the breech and it's ready to fire. This is an express model. There were only 31 of these made. And it came with this really fancy walnut stock, highly figured walnut stock and forend. And this one has been altered. I think originally it came with a tang sight because you can see these two screws right here where a tang sight was probably mounted. There's also a dovetail here that's been filled and a new dovetail made and this really blocky crude sight inserted in that, in that dovetail. So it's been modified, but it's still an interesting gun. Um, they didn't sell very well. There were several models. It was a military model. There were models that weren't quite as fancy or as well done as this Express model, but they didn't sell very well because people are slow to adopt new technology. It took me a long time to get a smartphone, for one thing, and people were so used to a hammer gun. You can tell when it's cocked. You know what's going on with it, and to have that all internal to the action was a turnoff. There's a letter that I ran across from a guy in Denver who had a gun store and sold lots of Sharps rifles, and he said, don't send me any more of those without a hammer. They just don't sell very well. So again, it was ahead of, probably ahead of its time. Didn't sell very well. Wasn't very popular with the traditional Sharps shooters, but still a, a fairly amazing uh, advance in firearms technology. We have uh, at least one other one, possibly two other bore charts in the collection. One is a military model. I chose not to bring that out because I wanted to talk about this one. So what's the story on this? Well, it may have belonged to Buffalo Bill, William Cody. And we have this letter from the person who donated the firearm to the museum. And she's writing to a museum staff person. I should have written this Monday, but I wish to check and fix the dates and had to search out the old photo albums and some family correspondence. The old Sharps Express rifle came to me through my father, William Russell Eagleton, who acquired it from my maternal grandfather, Theophilus Mayberry. You don't hear see many kids named Theophilus these days. Mr. Mayberry acquired the gun from Colonel William Cody when he visited the old government range south of Macy, Nebraska with Johannes Grimm of Blair, Nebraska. My grandfather was the boss farmer to the Omaha Indians at the time, and Mr. Grimm, a close friend, 
visited him often to shoot on the range which the army maintained on the reservation for the use of the troops stationed in Omaha when they bivouacked on the reservation in the summer. Colonel Cody sometimes accompanied Mr. Grimm on those outings. It was during one of these Schutzen fests. Schutzen is a specific type of match, of shooting match, and there are often firearms that are specifically designed for those type of matches. They normally have a very hooked butt plate and often a palm rest on the forehand. This one doesn't, but it still would have been accurate enough in its configuration to have been used in competition. So it was during one of these shoots and fests, shooting matches, that Grandfather acquired the old .45 by 2 and 7 eighths sharp from Mr. Cody. Well, a 45 by 2 and 7 eighths is basically your standard 4570 cartridge. This would have been sometime between 1906 and 1911. It was my pleasure to sit in audience when Johannes and grandfather discussed their guns and shooting over the evening meal. Colonel Cody was frequently mentioned as a regular fellow who was a friend, never with reference to his show business or scouting activities with the Army. So this is signed by E. Eagleton and it's notarized. Well, State laws differ, but normally a notarization only implies or states that the person who signs the document is the person they say you are, and it does not address the veracity of the statement. So this is a situation where uh, Bill Cody had a ranch and a home in North Platte, Nebraska, in the same area as the donor's family resided. So it's certainly possible that he was there in that time frame and that he may in fact have given this rifle to the donor's family. It's one of those things you can't really prove it one way or the other, but it seems possible, perhaps even likely. As I stated uh, in another video, I used to be really dismissive of people whose Oral history didn't match the facts, and then I discovered that a lot of my family history was rife with inaccuracy, so I tend to be a lot more forgiving. What was fairly interesting, as I was looking at this firearm, we, I removed the butt plate, because sometimes there will be an inscription or a name or something under that butt plate. There was not, but what was revealed is that the stock had been seriously broken right here at the wrist and repaired by driving a dowel into this part, into this part of the stock, and it was obviously held in place with epoxy. So epoxy was not a thing until maybe the 1960s or 70s. I did a little research on that. That was kind of inconclusive. But it's pretty clear that it's an extremely strong adhesive holding that dowel in place in the stock of this rifle. So when was that repair done? Uh, as far as I could tell from the museum records, that was never revealed when this firearm was acquired in a trade with the Museum of the Fur Trade in Shadron, Nebraska. This letter is addressed to James Hansen, and the Hansen family owned and operated that Museum of the Fur Trade. Still do, as far as I know. It's an excellent, excellent museum with lots of really cool firearms. So we traded, <clears throat> somebody at the museum back in the day traded this firearm, for this firearm, they traded a Northwest musket for this firearm and another one that allegedly belonged to Liver Eating Johnson, whose story was the basis of the movie that starred Robert Redford uh, called Jeremiah Johnson. The movie was significantly cleaned up from the real liver eating Johnson. So anyway, Sharp's Borchart rifle, been modified, been broken and repaired. One of 31 express rifles made by Sharp's, not a popular seller. 
but an interesting piece of firearms innovation. So if you've got questions or comments, put them in the space below, or you can call the museum. I'm not here every day, but they'll take a message, and I will get back to you if you have questions. I'm always happy to talk about firearms and history. So thank you for watching.